I want to take a moment to talk about Gestalt. Gestalt is a psychological theory put forth to describe how human beings, and more particularly how our mind, perceives the stimulus that we get. So how we see the world, how we hear things, smell things, how we take in that stimuli and interpret it. Our eyes don't actually do anything other than pass the information on, and then our mind interprets and chooses what to focus on and what meaning to glean from those things. So how it came about is a group of German psychologists got together and started studying. And the basic philosophy of Gestalt is that everything um, comes together and is not compartmentalized. Meaning, instead of compartmentalizing everything, it takes in all the elements it perceives as a whole form, or in other words, the perception of all of those elements is a separate and distinct thing from the elements themselves. One of those psychologists, Kurt Kafka, uh, famously said in German, the whole is other than the sum of its parts. Um, this has been mistranslated many times the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And he fought against that mistranslation saying, this is not a principle of addition. And he further is quoted as saying, it has been said, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. It is more correct to say that the whole is something else than the sum of its parts, because summing up is meaningless procedure, whereas the whole part relationship is meaningful. In other words, it's not to say that one is better than the other or one is greater than the other, but it's to say that the parts of something are different or other than what they come together to form. The whole form is the perception of that, and that is an other thing, and that is different than the parts that build that perception. Now, it's not a stretch to say that much of what has been described as aesthetic principles or design principles or principles of composition, or the laws of this or that, um, really has its foundation in the principles or the laws of Gestalt, um, specifically the perception that they described. And so instead of going through and memorizing a list of different design principles, which is, which is useful, it's, I think, foundationally important to understand what those are based on. And they are based on the way that our mind works. So just like we have gone through and decided, let's not talk specifically about how Facebook works right now today, and instead talk about the principles, the foundational bedrock principles of what it is that causes human behavior, how we want to be perceived, how we want to present ourselves, the reason that we want to get attention, those are bedrock foundational principles. So instead of specifically focusing on the principles of design, I want to focus on how our mind perceives the visual and audio stimuli that we come across. So one of the foundational principles of perception that really needs to be understood is that our mind seeks to separate figures from backgrounds. This is called the figure ground principle. And the figure ground principle is that when we look at something, we want to figure out what we're supposed to focus on and what is just the background or the scene behind that thing. And the background is called ground and the thing that we're trying to focus on is called the figure. There are a couple different things that will help us determine or distinguish what is the figure and what is the ground. Size is usually one of those things because typically regions of what we perceive that are smaller are usually the figure, but not always. The shape can also help us distinguish from the ground because it tends to be convex or bulge outwards instead of being concave or carve inwards. Um, people, shapes tend to bulge outwards. And so when we see a convex area, we tend to assume that that is a figure and not the background. Figures typically can move, whereas the background is usually a static environment. If we see a car driving across a horizon, we assume that the horizon, which is static, is the ground and the car is the figure or people crossing in front of something. Uh, figures tend to move against a static, unmovable environment. Color is also something that can cue or tell us what is a figure and what is not because people dress differently, cars are different colors. Things that tend to be figures are usually not a uniform thing, whereas the background travels in its 
same color scheme behind the figure. So that color of the background passes behind the figure. So that interruption of color of the background tends to say this interruption of color is the figure and the thing that continues behind that is the ground. Edge um, usually belongs to the figure. Now this is a little bit tricky, um, but because we typically perceive figures as having a convex or bulging outward shape that is also smaller than the ground, we tend to think that um, that edge belongs to the figure. When in reality, that edge doesn't belong to the figure or the ground, it is just the differentiation between the two. It's the space in between, or it's the way that our mind uh, delineates or perceives this is where the figure stops and this is where the background starts. But the background, we perceive it to exist behind the figure. And one of the things about figure ground is that it is the responsible for a number of optical illusions. The most famous of which, which is the vase, or is it two faces looking at each other, that type of thing. And it breaks several rules because it's typically concave rather than convex. Um, but in, in, any, in any case, uh, the figure ground is, is something that our mind really strives to perceive accurately because that helps us recognize. It's, it's built into our biology. Something moving might be a threat, a friend, a love interest. Um, the figures are things that we tend to fixate on for survival and uh, propagation of the species and whatnot, whereas the ground uh, or the background of the environment are things that those figures belong in. So as you can see here in some of these examples, um, there's a lot of optical illusions that you can get uh, based on figure ground. Um, for this, we see a face, but really there's just a weird shape and we're making a face out of that thing. It can be used in design. Um, you can see here that we have, you know, the penguin and Batman, okay, and which one is the figure and which one is the ground. Um, in photography, you can see a lot of photography um, uses figure ground, um, and you can use that kind of in an optical illusion, or you can use that, you know, in a way, see, I know that because this person is walking and it indicates movement here, okay, and the clouds in the sky pass behind her, and she has a different value, different color than that, that that's she's a figure and this is the ground. Or in this case, there is an edge, a distinct edge, and there is um, some contrast there, and we see background figure. And so it can be helpful in a number of different ways where you see you can differentiate between the background and the figure. Now in this case, the wave could also be considered figure because of the movement, because it has an edge. It is a convex edge and not a concave edge, but also this is a figure against this. And as we perceive this surfer, then this wave or whitewater break becomes the, the ground when it's perceived as the surfer. But as we perceive this, as a figure, then this background here becomes the ground. And so the figure ground relationship is based on perception and can be used uh, in design. So a lot of what you would consider to be negative space design, like the FedEx logo where we have this arrow here, a lot of this type of thing is a figure ground relationship where you can kind of see um, what is happening in the negative and the positive space. There's some, there's some interplay going on with that, and you can kind of see that. Pittsburgh Zoo is a great example of that. You can see, you know, is the tree the figure or is the tree the ground? And it depends on whether you're focusing on the animals or whether you're focusing on the tree, and it'll flip, flip back and forth. Your perception of that flips back and forth based on what you are focusing on at the time. Now, the next major law or rule is the law of pregnance, or what is also called the law of good gestalt. And basically what it means is that the mind seeks to simplify anything that it possibly can. Patterns, if something is regular, simple, orderly, if there's a 
if there's something that it can be simplified down, um, it will do that simplification. So it eliminates complexity. Um, anything unfamiliar tends to get ignored and it tries to break things down into most, its most simplistic form. And the reason that it does this is any anything that's extra, any extra stimulus um, helps to create meaning um, for the mind. So it's a uh, it creates a global norm, and basically what it means is that we have kind of a symbol system and that we don't notice certain things. We're not conscious or aware of things that we've simplified. Um, and this is the type of thing where it gives you an orderliness to the world. The world is not ordered. The world is extremely chaotic, and yet we, we simplify things in our perception of the world uh, to be able to process that information. The next law is the law of proximity, which basically is talking about the distance of uh, figures, relationships to each other. So when we look at a party, we perceive that people that are standing closer together are, have a stronger relationship. They are more related than individuals that are further apart from each other. So the distance um, of objects, uh, figures, things that we're looking at, the distance from each other uh, we indicate as an indication of their relationship to each other. Um, that, that's the law of proximity. Um, the law of similarity is kind of similar, except it talks about how things look. So we perceive that things are grouped together if they are like each other, if they have similar attributes. Um, you know, shape, color, shading, texture, um, sound. Other, other qualities you can kind of look at, but if, if they are occurring in multiple shapes, we assume that those are similar and that they are related. The law of closure is super interesting, and it's basically that if something is suggested or implied, we close that shape off. So in, in this example, you don't even see an entire shape. What you're really seeing is several broken lines that are kind of assembled, but we close that shape off and we um, indicate uh, something that isn't actually there. So we perceive um, shapes, letters, pictures um, as being whole, even though they're not complete, right? And this is something that you can suggest to the mind. You can suggest ideas um, and indicate something, and then our perception will fill in that gap, um, even though things could be missing from that. And uh, we do that because we want a regularity and things that are that are a lot of different things don't make as much sense as something that we can group together um, in something. Then there's the law of symmetry. The law of symmetry is basically that our mind really wants things to be ordered and symmetrical. So anytime that we can, we give a perception of symmetrical attributes to something uh, around a center point or center line. A mirrored symmetry could mean that there is a center line that is vertical and it is exactly a mirror image of the other thing. There's also um, asymmetrical balance, which is which kind of goes against the law of symmetry, but there's still kind of a nice balance to it. And then there's also radial balance, where instead of being a line that is reflected, everything is balanced around a center point. For example, like a flower and the petals are exuding or coming out of a central point. The law of common fate is kind of an interesting one, and it really involves movement. If movement is indicated, or if we actually see movement, whether we're looking at a still image or design or illustration, and it's indicated, or whether we're watching an animation or a video, because of the way that we have perceived and experienced the world, our experiences so far, and how physics works, um, we tend to see things moving along a motion path uh, that is common to us, which is usually the smoothest path. Very seldom do you see things take a sudden turn. There's, there's a vector that is smoother. So if we see an indication of something and there's, it could be one way where there's a lot of sharpness to it, a lot of sharpness to that indicated movement, um, or there's another way where there's, there's a lot of smoothness to the indicated movement, we will assume that the that the object is moving along the smoothest path. The law of continuity is the next one. And we group objects together that tend to have the same motion. So if you have, it's kind of like the law of common fate, except the law of continuity is involving um, 
objects that move together. Think of a flock of birds flying in a V. We perceive those birds as a group because they are moving together rather than those each individual bird. We don't know that there's 17 birds, we just know there's a group of birds. Um, and you've, you've probably seen this with insects that kind of fly in clouds and things like that, but we um, things that move together tend to be grouped and perceived together in our minds. And so if you see something in a design that has a specific vector or direction that is shared with another thing, we tend to think that those things are related to each other. And then finally, we have the law of past experience. The law of past experience basically means that your mind doesn't experience everything fresh every time it comes across something. We have years of perception and memory behind us, and that informs the way that we perceive something. As you approach a red octagon with a white border around it and you are driving, from past experience, you've already read that sign, you've been trained in driver's ed, and you know that you are supposed to move your foot and put it on the brake and slow your car and come to a complete stop. You don't actually read that sign because the law of past experience says that you can simplify that experience by saying, stop sign, I already know what to do, right? And so if you come across something like if you come across something that you've already had experience with, or you come across something where some of your past experiences might inform on something, you know that certain things are sharp or rough or smell or whatever, that experience informs your perception, even though it may not relate. So you can assume a lot about your environment and how you perceive your environment based on the rules of Gestalt. So for example, um, I see right here, I see an animation that shows me um, a series of lines or rectangles and curves, um, but I perceive that they are grouped together because they are moving in a similar way. The fact that they continue to spin and zoom in a similar way, I view them as one cohesive piece rather than as a series of little lines. Um, also, you can look at a number of different things, right? You can say that as this header here scrolls down with everything, it is connected to this. But there is some proximity difference, and I can see that there is a greater space in between these two things than there is in these two things, so I perceive that this H2 is more related to this paragraph than it is to this. And then, based on those things, this and this. Those are similar shapes, so I can relate them together because they have the law of similarity gives me those things. And then when it comes to movement, um, when I mouse over one of these things and it has a menu that pops out, that menu, I relate this, all of these objects, all of these letters together because they move together. They show up together. There is movement together with them. Um, they also have a, a similar background. And then if we look at figure ground, these letters, the white letters are the figures and the ground is the blue, right? And so I differentiate those things in my mind and I don't perceive that the ground is something that I need to focus on. I focus on what those letters are. Those letters, again, in the rule of proximity, um, they are grouped together so that T-H-E is a word. I know that those three things are more related than the letters that follow that because of the proximity that they have to each other. Um, so there's a number of things that you can get from this and you know movement as as the logo up here as I scroll down and get smaller it, it shrinks and becomes less important because of there's something that's moving. This movement is grabbing my eye and everything else kind of becomes background whereas this becomes the figure mainly because it's moving. And you can kind of see that as all of this scrolls and moves together it has a similar tracking as I scroll up and down that I assume it's all related together. If only part of it moved I would assume that the part that moved together was more related than the others. For example if you look over on the left the little texture details here don't scroll, they're fixed, right? So they are not as related to this text as the text is to itself because it moves together. So to sum it up, remember that things are not as they seem, things are as they are perceived. Um, I mean, there is actually a reality and there are actually things out there um, but our perception of those things is something separate or something different than the way things actually are. And understanding how our mind simplifies and perceives those things um, will help us in our composition of our videos, in the movement of our graphics, in the design of our posters, um, 
and in the typography that we choose. Um, and it's very, very important to remember that you craft everything according to the message and the audience, and Gestalt applies to your audience because your audience is using perception, not reality. So remember uh, to understand that these are the foundational principles of design and composition um, as you move forward, and that should help you understand how things work and why we see things the way that we do.